Monster Professor. Welcome to the Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, games, film, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And a few housekeeping notes before we get started with our monster of the day. Um, my newest book, and it's actually a debut collection of short stories. I've put out a novel before, but not a book of short stories. Well, it's now available for pre-order. If you're listening to this before the publication date, uh, the official one of March 15th, If you're listening to this after March 15th, 2019, then it's available right now. So check out uh, the publisher's website, press53.com. Check out their bookstore and their short fiction collection. You're going to see my book, Oh Monstrous World. It's a collection of stories I've written over the years. And you can also find that link on my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. You can even pre-order it on amazon.com. Just uh, search amazon.com for Oh Monstrous World or check out my author's page. You can find it there. I think it's a, it's a really fun book. And if you like the kinds of things that we talk about on this podcast, then some of these stories, I think all of the stories will be up your alley. So check that out. I appreciate it. So for today, I want to talk about invisible monsters. So by invisible monsters, I'm thinking of a category of a type of monster. Um, I'm not making any reference to the book by Chuck Palahniuk, Invisible Monsters, by the way, or at least I don't mean to, but I'm making that reference now. That's a good book. Uh, As I recall, that was his first one, and no publisher or agent wanted anything to do with it, and he was so like resentful and furious that he decided to write something just antisocial and something that was going to make everybody mad. So he wrote Fight Club in response. And of course, that was the one that everybody loved. And and that put him on the map and and made him rich and famous and everything. Um, But uh, his but invisible and then Invisible Monsters was later published because they wanted anything they could uh, get their hands on that had his name on it. And but you read that one and that one has a lot more of that like raw uh, energy that uh, first books so often have (laughs) rough around the edges but really cool. Uh, I remember them talking about making a movie of this thing and it's, it would be darn near unfilmable. I mean, the main character would be this supermodel who has, who's like missing a jaw and her tongue is just hanging there. <laughs> like I think John Waters maybe could have made the film for this thing back in 1977, but I don't know if anyone can make it now. Anyway, it's worth checking out, but not the kind of monsters we want to talk about today. I want to talk about monsters that you literally cannot see. And uh, I, so many cool ones to talk about. Maybe we should go a little bit chronologically. I think the first real like invisible killer, invisible monster um, was the story of the of Gyges and the ring of Gyges. Uh, I think probably the most famous version of that is the one that shows up in Plato, uh, I think in his Republic, if I'm remembering correctly, um, in which Socrates and some of the other characters are talking about like what makes, what makes social norms or, or right and wrong in a society, what makes them hold. And so they started playing with this story of this guy who, um, who comes across this cave that was recently reopened by an earthquake and he goes down in there and he finds this ring 
or in some stories, this pair of rings, but you put on the ring and you turn it a certain way and you turn invisible. You can turn it another way and you turn back to visible. And so the first thing uh, Gyges does with this ring is decide to go straight for the king uh, to seduce his wife, although it's not clear how the invisible part helped that. Um, but to, And then he, of course, murders the king and then takes the throne himself. And so very quickly he uses his powers for invisibility, uh, for evil and power gain. There, uh, the point they were arguing is whether... Uh, whether or not if anything you did couldn't be seen or known by other people and you had free reign to commit any kind of crime or see through any sort of dark fantasy that you wanted to and invisibility was like their storytelling image of that if you had that freedom what would you do and one of the characters was arguing to Socrates uh, that that human nature is determined into this kind of invisible monster the moment you have the chance. Uh, Socrates argued with him that, and and, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's been a long time, but if I'm remembering correctly, something to the effect of, uh, uh, of no, your, your, your crimes are kind of at that point overtaking you, that changes who you are and you kind of lose out to this other different creature, um, whether you do it visible or not, it has the same kind of negative effect. You don't, you don't get a pass just because no one saw you do the thing, uh, because you saw yourself do the thing no matter what. So, um, those of you uh, who are familiar with the works of J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, and are maybe hearing the Ring of Gyges story for the first time from ancient Greece are thinking, wait a minute, a magic ring that turns you invisible and that tempts you into evil and, and power grabbing. Isn't that kind of like something I might've heard about in Lord of the Rings? Yes, I, I think very much so. Um, and there's a lot I want to talk about in regards to that, but I am currently teaching a Tolkien literature class and I save up a whole lot of my best Tolkien stuff for that. Um, because otherwise, if I got talking too much about, uh, Lord of the Rings, Silmarillion, um, the various works of Tolkien, then this podcast would very quickly just turn into another Tolkien podcast. And you already have a great one out there. Uh, Corey Olson's Tolkien professor classes or recorded lectures. There's no beating those, uh, for podcast quality. So I'll let him have that realm. Uh, every now and then I'll focus on, I think we'll spend some time on some Tolkien monsters, but I want to save up. So with that mention, um, I'm probably going to avoid a little bit talking about the Nazgul or Gollum or the rings as invisible monsters and maybe focus on a few other ones. So if we're going chronologically, um, although there are, I believe some, especially if you bring in ghosts and stuff, although there are other monsters that have been like invisible between the time of the ancient Greek uh, stories and now the main one that that starts us off with the kind of modern tradition of the invisible monsters, I think is in 1893, Ambrose Bierce uh, published a story called The Damned Thing. Ambrose Bierce, you might know, you might be familiar with his, uh, his story, The Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, which is an excellent story. In fact, in, um, in any sort of like writing class scenario, uh, students or, or young writers who are exploring different story ideas for the first time very often come across this moment where they, they feel like they've invented the story idea in which the whole story was just a dream. Can you imagine now? Now, if you've never run across that story before, maybe maybe you do think it's it's uh it's kind of cool and and edgy and new. Those of you who have been around stories for a long time and know that it's it was all just a dream is one of the most tired tropes uh, that you could you could come across. However, 
that's not to say that it can't be done really well. And the person who kind of was the pioneer pioneer of doing it really well was uh, Ambrose Beers, uh, Ambrose Beers uh, occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. I think uh, he also wrote uh, the Devil's Dictionary, which is just endlessly funny. Uh, if you just scroll through there at any time, it is it's set up as a dictionary, but all the definitions are of this kind of modern cynicism. I think I think really we could just replace all of our current dictionaries with just this one, and it would make perfect sense to everybody. Just ever so briefly, like um, you know, you scroll to just or uh, you flip to just W, uh, and you look up some of his definitions there. Uh, war. The first sentence in his definition of war is a byproduct, a byproduct of the arts of peace, <laughs> and then, or maybe one that's relevant to this show. Ambrose Bierce's Devil's Dictionary definition of werewolf. He says, "A wolf that was once or is sometimes a man. All werewolves are of evil disposition, having assumed a bestial form to gratify a bestial appetite, but some." transformed by sorcery, are as humane as is consistent with an acquired taste for human flesh. (laughs) He's so funny. Um, He was ahead of his time on so many things. I I brought him up on a previous podcast, I believe, The Robots and Golems, a podcast in which he's one of the first writers to have kind of a a robot rise up and, and kill its creator master kind of thing. Well, in the damned thing... It's this kind of discussion story mystery about the strange death or murder and this witness trying to convince others of what really happened saw that this man fought, was attacked by some type of invisible beast out in the field. And this invisible thing, this damned thing, um, would they only knew it was there? Well, the witness only knew it was there because he saw it like making impressions in the grass. Like he would, he would like the the grass would be pushed down as he as he went along or walked or tromped along. He couldn't tell what was happening to the man when he was being attacked because he's like he would be he would seem to fling himself around or twist his own arm up in some type of impossible way but then the witness noticed that in a certain in a certain form whatever he was seeing uh, the image and the light seemed to be distorted in a certain way as if he were seeing through air that was being disturbed or maybe light that was being bent in a type of prism And so this thing wasn't entirely visible. It was somehow bending light around itself. And one of the final conclusions that this that this witness is making um, is that that certain uh, animals have evolved different types of camouflage. Um, this is 1893, so well in the realm of um, of Darwin's uh, ideas about evolution uh, being still uh, very well known and very popular as well. And so you would get types of, of well, essentially this is science fiction, right? Um, you would get various types of science fiction still kind of revved up from those ideas. And his thought was that maybe if animal, if certain beasts in the world can evolve to camouflage themselves in different surroundings just by looking like the surrounding or altering their pigment for a surrounding, why couldn't an animal uh, alter itself in a way that say some minerals can do which is to bend light around themselves one of the main inspirations was not too long before the story came out uh, a lot of new findings on optics and lenses and bending light and properties of images that we see and ambrose Bierce was was kind of revved up and inspired by that too and so he gave us the damned thing And so I would say, you know, it could fall under the category, what I meant by science fiction, it could fall under that category uh, because the fundamental uh, feature that turns the story 
is some aspect of science that is draws from a fact of science that is the next step possibility that's still fiction right now but theoretically could be based on science i think that that would qualify essentially as hard science fiction um but also horror and i think that the two kind of can cross paths or or be one and the same for many different types of stories um we might even say this was uh, an example of both science fiction and horror being one and the same and a uh, and a connection to the damn thing you might think of this as like isn't that uh, a prequel to the predator <laughs> or didn't that uh, wasn't that like the the ancestor of the movie the predator and the various predator movies what well, it sure seems like it when you read this thing it sounds except for like his little laser beam shoulder cannon thing the predators um it reads in all other ways exactly as if uh, the predator was attacking people in 1893 so maybe the damn thing was one of the earlier predator hunts i don't know um speaking of like prequels to the predator i always wanted i what i wanted for from out of predator 2 or maybe some other predator was i wanted it to, to be set back in like the year 500 or like four, eight, yeah, let's say 500. And I wanted the predator to end up in, um, at the hall of Herat and King Hrothgar. And I wanted him to start attacking their warriors in the hall at night. And then I wanted Beowulf to come over and hear about this monster and fight it. And so I wanted the predator story to be the Beowulf story and Grendel is the predator. And so Beowulf is like fighting hand to hand with this predator and ends up tearing off his arm that has this self-destruct nuclear device so he can't just you know fall back on that plan and that's what they hang up over the door and he flees back to the mothership that has kind of been buried just like grendel's mother's cave you know down in down under the falls and in the swamp and so beowulf goes out uh, and, and, and instead of uh, going to fight Grendel's mother as his second monster, he gets down into the in Grendel's mother's cave. Instead, he gets down into the mother ship of the predator hunters, and then he encounters a female predator, which would be like this massive monstrous thing that puts the, the male predator hunters to shame. That would have been so cool. And so you'd have a whole Beowulf predator right there i think that would have been awesome um but you know since i i probably will never get around to writing that screenplay and let's say one reason is because even if i did nothing would happen with it other than it's just being some type of weird fan fiction and that would be about it and so i pulled a kilgore trout by the way by that I'm referring to uh, Kurt Vonnegut and one thing he would do is in many of his different novels he would slide in this character a recurring character Kilgore Trout which sounds like a description of some version of himself and he was like this pulp science fiction writer and he would and he would describe Kilgore Trout some of Kilgore Trout's latest project ideas and they almost all seem like some of the stories that Kurt Vonnegut himself might have been interested in writing but he was never going to get around to it so he just wrote about somebody else writing about that thing so he could just get the idea out there and then be done with it and so that's Kilgore trouting an idea in my mind and so I Kilgore trouted Beowulf or Predator 2 as the Beowulf story and in a story of mine called it's in the collection the debut collection by the way if I'm going to plug it one more time oh monstrous world in one of the stories, uh, one of the characters uh, starts talking, says, you know, what Predator should have been, and then he lays out that same idea that I just said. And so I 
kind of in a way put it out there, but without actually putting in the work. So it's one of the laziest ways to handle a story idea that you're excited about. So um, you might be wondering, okay, back to the invisible monster thing, the damned the damned thing, 1893. I mean, wasn't H.G. Wells's Invisible Man before that? I think actually Invisible Man was a few years later. Um, not to say exactly that H.G. Wells was inspired directly by Ambrose Bierce's story, but I mean, 1897, I believe is the date on Wells. So he was a, he was a handful of years behind. And I think in all likelihood, he was inspired uh, by Ambrose Bierce, as so many were. The Invisible Man is a really cool book. God, you, um, you, it takes this idea of being physically in, invisible um, and in just your natural, like, naked state and and that's that's it like if you put on clothes you're not invisible um but that it takes it takes that concept so far and so seriously essentially what the guy would have to do to remain invisible is to run around naked all the time and when you're running around naked in like a cold damp environment then you're probably gonna get sick and miserable and he ends up, I mean, very, very quickly, uh, this character ends up being a vicious, uh, you know, killer, murderer kind of guy. And so he's a, he's a monster and it's unclear like how long he's been evil or whether this invisibility has made him evil. And as eventually, um, the whole, the whole town or the whole village starts catching on that they've got this invisible monster on the loose. And so he's trying to continue to hide and complete invisibility, but he has a cold because he's naked everywhere he goes. And so he's trying to like not sneeze. He ends up uh, hiding out in a what is essentially a, a mall, like a like a late Victorian era mall, and like sleeping in the in the display beds and stuff and trying not to sneeze to give himself away. Cause if you hear something, but you're not seeing anything, that means he's there. And, and so the whole, the whole town and, and various surrounding towns finally figure it out. Like, look, it's just a guy who's invisible. And all we have to do is to stop him is the same things we would do to stop a fugitive. So they cut off transportation, they block and guard the roads, they have scouts everywhere and everybody in town is trying to hunt this guy down and they start closing in the circle and closing it in on him and he keeps trying to find ways to not get detected but to slide through them and it doesn't work and he keeps having a retreat back to the center of the circle and they keep they don't know where exactly he is but they know he's not outside of the circle they're making and so chapter after chapter they're getting closer and closer to him until he finally is cornered uh, against kind of as i'm i remember and envisioning it a uh, kind of like a like a cliff wall almost like this and then and then the the villagers are like surrounding surrounding him and they finally figure out that he's somewhere in the space right in front of him so they start like kicking and attacking and and beating at the air, knowing that they're engaging with something and harming something and they can hear his cries. And so the whole town essentially lynches him, this invisible form uh, on the ground right in front of him. But as they do, the moment they finally kill him, uh, he rematerializes, he becomes visible again. And that's when you get this, this surprise reaction out of everybody. They see him and they go, Oh, he's disgusting. Like they're all revolted and disgusted by him because he's an albino. And he's also just kind of naturally unattractive and ugly on top of his albinism. So it's not like one of these sexy, cool, kind of angelic looking albinism uh, cases. He's just this weird, ugly al albino guy. And they all like hate that. And then it becomes clear. They never really clarified why 
he went to these extreme measures to turn himself invisible and, and why he got so resentful that he became like this murderous monster of a man who, who had no, uh, who had really no kind of moral, um, moral checks on his behavior. No, he was no longer held back by anybody else's standards or anything. And so essentially kind of the ring of Gyges, uh, storyline, but it never, it never said what that backstory was or why it never even says his name. I mean, even his name is invisible to us, uh, which was, I think a good move by HG Wells. And then once you see everyone's reaction to how he looked before he turned himself invisible, then it starts to become clear. Oh, he was, I mean, there were hints that he was treated poorly and he couldn't get the respect he deserved as a simple kind of chemist and student, but it never gets into detail on that. And then you can see, oh, everybody hated him because of the way he looked. And his whole life was ruined by this kind of weird, um, this, this weird bigotry that was essentially a type of racist bigotry, but also the, the more common kind of bigotry is that you're not as attractive as everybody wants you to be. So they treat you in this weird way. And so he turned, so they kind of drove him to be a monster and then they end up lynching him all the same anyway. And then what do you get? You get that final revelation at the end. And so I like to call that the horror reverse. It's a, uh, one of the moves in a, in a horror story or something that's essentially horror is that there's some element of inevitability or implication in that the characters involved in the story were destined to do this thing or be involved in this horrible thing. Or the horror reverse is the implication as in you are actually responsible for the monster and are a monster in your own way. As you go out hunting for monsters, you find that you were the monster you were hunting for. And so when stories, I think Invisible Man is one of those great horror reverses because it doesn't draw too much attention to itself at the end. Um, but if you're, if you're, you know, close reading of it shows you how kind of shockingly powerful that is. I think in part because he leaves it so subtle at the end. It's a fantastic novel. Um, so where, where should we go from there for invisible monsters? I, I mean, why not right back in, right back into predator? Uh, there's a, I remember, a. the, the Predator, the, the original 80s film, was is one of these weird films that shouldn't still hold up. It shouldn't still be as good as it is. But I remember at a uh, at one Halloween party at somebody else's uh, place, it was actually <laughs> it was actually a it was actually a trailer that uh, I at one point owned that some, but I wasn't living in. And then at somebody else, kind of like. Um, broke in there and squatted in there and I didn't know for months and then uh he ended up buying it off of me <laughs> because I uh, liked it so much I happened to f know the person the whole time and he thought some for some reason that I knew that he was in anyway this is way off track um <laughs> it was a it was at a Halloween party at the time where he owned this trailer and um the on TV, just in the background, was uh, was Predator playing. I'm like, oh, that's Predator. But it's like, yeah, and we're just kind of moving through the room and doing other stuff. And then, like, person by person, minute by min minute, we kind of start trickling back in front of the TV until we're all just kind of standing in front of it and watching these moments. Like, wait a minute, there is no reason why this movie from decades ago should still be compelling uh, to a group of people who have a whole lot of other entertainment right in front of them. What something about it is still really watchable, even though most of it is a whole bunch of like <laughs> beefcakes with machine guns walking through, uh, the, the lawn and garden section of Lowe's, <laughs> like pushing their way through plants and, and then just like really dramatic movement music, uh, a while guys like push leaves out of the way. Like if you cut all those minutes out of predator, the whole thing's like 15 minutes long. <laughs> 
why is it so good? I don't really know. I think part of it might be that, um, that, let's see, the story is kind of built on revelation, like finding out one extra new little bit of information that leads you toward another little bit of information where you see highly capable people thrown in a circumstance that in which they're no longer, they no longer have the upper hand. And so they need to like figure out this mystery. There's something that's always going to be compelling about a story that has something intriguing that you find out about it just bit by bit, little by little. Um, even if you, as a viewer of it or a reader of it, already know the secret or the outcome or the whole backstory, it's still kind of interesting to watch the characters go through these moments of little revelation. I think that's always going to be compelling. Part of the reason why Predator uh, holds up so well, I think. And maybe, an, maybe another reason uh, it's so good is because for a lot of those monster films um, and, and those kinds of the horror films, it's so intriguing to have the monster or at least the most interesting aspects of the monster be unseen. Um, and so or unseen throughout so much of the film until maybe the very end uh, when you no longer need to keep hiding it for that kind of intrigue and tension. Um, I'm thinking of Jaws as in like everybody kind of acknowledges the fact that one of the most terrifying features of the original Jaws film is that you don't get to see Jaws until you finally do at the end and then it's not quite as scary which I think we mentioned before happened kind of by accident that they were planning on uh, showing Jaws the whole time but the animatronic thing kind of failed in the in the I think the salt water they hadn't really prepped for that and so they just had to film around it um and the, in the kind of, uh, in the way that what Sam Raimi copied for the evil cam and, and the evil dead films, um, and the original alien, I think one of the most terrifying features of it is you just get like hints and, and glimpses of, of this creature that keeps seeming to look a little bit different than what you thought he looked like before. And you can't really see it all, um, or maybe even say the exorcist where all you see is the little girl, but you don't see the demonic threat in the room. You don't see what is possessing her and you're kind of wondering. And so any, so this is maybe another little practical guide for writers. If you want to make something really terrifying, figure out what the most intriguing part of it is and try to hide that part. Um, and, uh, let's see, let me, how about, let me hit one more invisible monster thing that I like so much. It's from one of my favorite kind of monster myth, folklore, horror films. It's, um, it's a Russian one based off the, based off the novels, um, called Night Watch. And I think this was back in like 2000 three or something like that early 2000s it's fascinating and it's and the book is great but or the books are great but the movie kind of ramps it up a notch so i think it's one of those examples in which one of those many examples in which the movie ends up being better than the book um and in in night watch the film there's a moment in which our main character is going in to arrest this vampire because he turned this young lady into a vampire without getting the proper license and without filling out the proper paperwork which is i'm laughing about it but it's a very serious matter to them um if you're a monster in the former soviet union that you do everything by the book and so they end up uh, he ends up tracking him down into a an abandoned barber shop 
and he demands that this vampire come out of the gloom. He gives them orders, and it's the gloom is like they can, they, some of the creatures can shift themselves into the nether world or the shadow world in which they're still present, but they see things differently, and you can't see them. This is the exact same kind of uh, physics of the Nazgul and Tolkien, by the way. I've been trying really hard not to keep bringing up Tolkien. Even in the damned thing, you have the moment where the invisible monster is making impressions on the grass. Well, back in this in the Silmarillion uh, by Tolkien, the, the time when Isildur, who cut off the ring of Sauron, is, it, it claimed it for himself, and, and the Gladden Fields, with the disaster of the Gladden Fields, and the orcs are Things are going bad and the orcs are hunting him down, but he's invisible. Tolkien writes that they they tracked him by scent and slot through the grass. And you're like, scent and slot through the... What's scent and slot? Oh, in the grass, they can smell him, but they can also see the the his path is essentially this long groove through the grass, the slot that they... And so talk about a wonderful brief way to handle sounds and words. Tolkien was so good at that. Um, I think year after year, people are starting to realize his language mastery uh, that and uh, and maybe stop diminishing him for kind of nonsense reasons or false accusations and start realizing uh, how powerful of a storyteller and poet he was. I am way off track. I knew it was going to happen. Okay, back to Nightwatch. Um, so this so this vampire is in the gloom and so he is invisible and uh the guy is afraid to go into the gloom and chase him because that's it's dangerous to to his own life he can't stay there for very long so he's trying to fight off this vampire who's messing with him and he can see him in the mirrors though. And so it's kind of this nice, every monster in night watch or every type of occult, uh, kind of horrific feature of it, like reverses or plays with, or brings in completely different ideas than the typical kind of, uh, what American tropes on the thing. And so in this one, he can see this vampire in mirrors. And so as they're fighting and throwing each other around and they break up glass and he's holding this mirror right in front of his face to try to turn and turn around to see if he can catch glimpses of him while the vampire has these like tiny little barber shears that he just keeps uh, stabbing into him like these tiny little puncture wounds all over him. And it's this really brutal, hardcore scene. And he ends up... uh, when he finally kind of offs the vampire uh, by um, his friends pull in at the very last minute and blast these kind of uh, anti-vampire bulbs in the room and he uses the mirror to like reflect the light and kill him and the vampire is thrown back and smashes against this porcelain sink but his own skull breaks like porcelain you in this surreal moment where you're waiting to see the porcelain break and he breaks apart like porcelain and he's dead God, it's visually, it's so compelling and amazing. Um, I'm not necessarily a cinematographer, and I don't know how one would train cinematographers, but I'm guessing that uh, anyone trying to figure out how to play with with editing an image and um, and all sorts of other visual features and films ought to watch Night Watch and study every damn scene of that movie because it's just so amazing. Um, well, so I think, I don't know, how'd that, fe- how'd that feel to you? I think we covered a lot of uh, intriguing, invisible monsters. Um, and if you made it this far into the show, then once again, congratulations, you survived another outing with the monster professor. So which kind of monster are we going to talk about next time? What's coming up for future shows? You'll just have to wait and see, but I've got some interesting ones planned and some interesting interviews kinds of uh, uh, interesting interviews scheduled coming up. So we've got some cool things coming up in 2019 and thank you very much for spending time with and listening to The Monster Professor. Professor.